Hi there, I'm Tom Field. I'm Senior Vice President of Editorial with Information Security Media Group. Topic of conversation today, ransomware and compliance. I am very pleased to welcome to the virtual studio, small panel. I have got Ajay Badia, GM, Digital Compliance and Commerce with Veritas. He's joined by Jose Thomas, GM, Enterprise Cloud Solutions with Microsoft Financial Services. Jose, Ajay, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Tom. Be here. So let's start the conversation here in a J. I wonder if you might take this first and Joe, please jump in. We've all seen the ransomware headlines over the past several months. What are the current trends that concern you the most? I think Tom, I, I would say two of them. One is the pervasiveness of the ransomware attacks. And the second is the, uh, I would say maturity and sophistication. You know, it's just our research shows an average company experiences about two and a half attacks in a year every 11 seconds in the industry. Um, 15% of those experience a attack five or six times again. So if it's not, it's not a question of if it will happen, but when it does and have we backed up or do we pay up? And as far as the maturity of ransomware, it's evolved into some sort of a division of labor. We're now seeing a two tier supply chain where developers build and sell the malware and other cyber criminals then go ahead and buy these RAS kits and carry out the attacks. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point there, AJ. I, I would say, Tom, look, I, as we talk to our customers and we see this across the industry, you know, prevention is, is something that we really try to focus on. Um, what we often find is the value of, of preparation is not really understood until an event happens. And so we, we try to make sure, hey, are, are the right sockets covered? Are you properly uh, structured right? Uh, is, there, is there governance in place for those that have access to information and those that shouldn't, right? And so those are kind of the areas, I think, as, as, as Microsoft looks into this space in trying to lean in and help our customers, it's let's, let's get in the front end, front end of this and not, you know, not leave ourselves exposed to something that could happen. So, Joe, when it comes to ransomware and compliance, what are the specific pain points your customers articulate to you? And of course, Ajay, I'd love you to weigh in. Uh, you know, I, I think first of all, there's a there's a sentiment of surprise and shock. It's like, what do we do here? Is this, you know, this is not the kind of environment where their folks are trained and ready to respond, right? So, do do we go along with this? You know, what's really at risk? How much uh, do we do we play along? Uh, and this is a you know, and I think in this in this there's a, there's a whole new discipline being formed around this, right? And so, so for for our customers, they they come to us and say, hey, we need advice, we need we need help in in trying to navigate through some of this. Yeah, I think I, I can you know echo the same sentiments. It's it's more about how can I reduce the chance that an attack is successful. Right, knowing that X percent of my data is dark, but if an attack is successful, then how do I limit my disruptions? Right, a lot of folks report being down for a week or longer, and then how do I know that I'm actually recovering from clean data? Right, there's there's a certain dormancy before the attack about the ransomware, and a certain level of confidence associated with what we would call a um, last known good copy. Right, so that's the ransomware side of it. From a compliance standpoint, if I say, if you focus on you know financial services customers. Um, the ballooning of content sources and the ability to showcase compliance for all is a major uh, concern for our customers because, you know, a major U.S. bank, for example, was fined um, millions of dollars for not including connectors like WhatsApp uh, in its FINRA compliance envelope. Then there is the increasing risk of data privacy for this particular set of customers as well, because in U.S., there is new Reg BI scrutiny for money laundering and making sure market abuse policies are in place. Um, multimodal content capture, which is what we say is, you know, communication surveillance, sentiment analysis, topic mining, all of these things are, are front and center for compliance for a lot of the financial services customers for us. And then the ideal, you know, holy grail would be reconstructing a trade versus, you know, linking that to relevant communications in, in the same, uh, in the same realm. Uh, beyond the ransom itself, which we know can get into millions of dollars, what are the other potential costs of attack? Ajay, maybe you can take that first and Joe, offer your perspective. 
Sure, you know, I think there's, I would look at it from a perspective of short term and long term. Short term, you know, it's, it costs about two and a half million dollars an hour uh, in terms of downtime costs. Um, so the inability to conduct business as usual or not at all, that will be the short term impact. From a long term side of it, uh, Tom, it's, it's, it's impossible to keep these kind of events private. They can damage a company's reputation. Um, there's a future valuation question. And again, I find that <clears throat> I would say two thirds of these companies pay the ransom and doing that paints a target on their back, right? And there's regulatory penalties that we have to experience as well because you're squeezed between what you would call cyber laws or penalties on one side and then the rising cyber insurance premium on the other side. So it, it does have a, a little bit longer effect and rather than just you know losing your data and trying to get it back. Yeah, I'm not sure I could have answered that much better, AJ, but I would say trust is a hard thing to put a price on. Right. I mean, that's probably one of the biggest components as, as, as our customers go through this journey, the fear is what gets out there in the marketplace and then what happens to the brand because now their customers are impacted. Right. And so once you have credibility and once you've got that established, it may take 10 years or 15 years to build that up, but very quickly you can erode that. And then the, it, it's, it's very hard to put a value on that. So Joe, so Jay, where do you see the biggest gaps in your customers' current abilities to detect, to respond, and recover? I, I think for us, uh, just, just knowledge. You know, our industry has not, this has not been the forefront uh, of, of, you know, moving to the cloud and everything is, has been what we've been focusing on. But all of a sudden, cyber and, and security and ransomware and all of these areas are becoming very, very important and we have to be reactive. So there's an element of training and education and preparedness uh, within our customer base, as well as our own in, in trying to be ready for this. So for me, I would say probably one of the largest gaps is just awareness. I don't know that folks know what to do and nor are they trained and prepared for it uh, in the event. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, there's data that shows about 15% of the breaches in the world are associated with cyber and it's growing. <clears throat> On the other side, you know, companies still struggle with it, even though it's, it's, it's come up to be such a big number. I think in terms of detection for us, when we see this, this is more about just knowing where your data is, right? Because not knowing what you have, where it is, how valuable it is, it, it makes you vulnerable. And given, you know, I would say the velocity, the variety, the sophistication of the attacks. This is both a, a I would say, a customer I and mean, a vendor and a partner infrastructure update problem. In terms of response, the unknown impact back to what Joe said, which is you're not sure where or how to respond, you're running against a time clock. Um, and, and from a recovery standpoint, it's a known fact. We all know that most organizations do not optimize for recovery, they optimize for protection. So there's one policy for everything. There are no recovery rehearsals. And so that experience is always a mess because there is no plan. And most likely, even if there is, there is it's never been tested or in a non-disruptive or, or, you know, I would say an ad hoc manner. So that, that all definitely leaves, uh, you know, organizations exposed. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions for you to dive a little bit deeper into some of these topics. And so let's start here. What do you find most hinders organizations readiness for a ransomware attack as well as that initial response? What gets in their way? So I, I would say, you know, beyond, beyond the uh, failure to plan and test the plan that we just talked about, there's some specific hurdles for financial institutions. One is, um, I would say, lack of a unified solution. And let me explain that. Wall Street and even healthcare are two venerable industries that had to shed their traditional models during the pandemic. And they were forced to adapt to, I would say, a hastened digital transformation brought on by the pandemic. And again, both are very, very highly regulated and cannot choose not to comply, which means then the two worlds of data complexity and regulatory complexity then need to be bridged, but then that needs to be done on a 24 7 365 basis. So this sometimes leaves what I would call a vulnerability gap that's susceptible to ransomware and because not all vendors can offer a unified solution across you know, protection recovery compliance. And then the second aspect is I would say it's more, more specific to financial institutions is they besides the discussion of lack of resources, it's the perfect storm of high value sensitive data, modern workloads, and then an aging architecture. So 
it's it's very lucrative business to to go and target people that have the propensity to pay and also have that high criticality of service. So there's still most banks that we talk to, they're still evolving their intrusion prevention systems. They're elevated to a zero trust approach, but there's still a lot of work to do in terms of digital certificates, access to uh, a trusted access to a limited code and, and minimum admin access. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you read about all of these financial institutions being the most targeted, but even though it's authorized under, for example, the Patriot Act, most banks and financial institutions do not share information between themselves to help identify or maybe report and prevent some of these evolving ransomware schemes. So those are two areas I would say are, are specific to this industry. Jay, I want to come back to another topic you raised earlier, clean data. Talk about clean data and the keys to a true operational recovery. Sure, Tom. I think that, you know, to me, I would say operational recovery is, is synonymous with resiliency. That means the company has had deployed worm storage. It's got immutability across BYO, cloud, and SaaS, has evolved the management of the data encryption. Um, they've defined granular role-based access. So there's what we call is just in time, just enough access. And then they have identified the location of their critical data across protection and infrastructure vendors. Then I would say you, you create a walled off network that looks exactly like your production network, uh, but with different management credentials. You, know, you can use these spaces to recover the data and services and scrub the data. The phase of recovery that's more important to me is maintaining control. So confirmation of the last known good copy. So you know you have a clean set of data, a full malware scan in an isolated environment before restoring the data. And then in adopting, adopting a, I would say, an automated recovery orchestration at scale. So, you know, cyber criminals hope that, you know, your organization is like most, not optimized for recovery. And so the goal is to be able to architect a recovery plan with clean data that works for different levels of impact and granularity, such as file or instance or multi-tier applications, or even recovering an entire data center in the cloud, right? So at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about so much more than just a restore point. I just want to bring you back into the conversation. I have a question for both you and Ajay. How do Microsoft and Veritas partner today to help customers improve their readiness, their response, and their recovery capabilities? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start with that one. You know, we take a bit of a platform approach, you know, having been in the enterprise space for so many decades, uh, we take the, the, the trust that our customers put in our hands very seriously. And so kind of going through that, that same common theme of trust, it's built into every one of our products and services in the cloud, security and protection and privacy. These are all just very, very core tenants for us. Now there's, there's definitely a space where partners like Veritas are gonna be much, much deeper in helping out in uh, specific scenarios, especially like ransomware. So Ajay, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you talk to some of the specialties there. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I, I think you know I'll, I'll start off by saying that <clears throat> when you when you contrast what we said, which is businesses cannot choose to not comply, and now they cannot choose to not be protected against cybercrime, and now they're also hastily moving to cloud adoption. That that trust is a big the trust quotient becomes very important, and then there's also this amalgamation I would say of uh, decision making personas within every company and a strong desire to partner with organizations that serve those all those three outcomes across the spectrum. And so with Microsoft and Veritas, I think we sit right in the middle of that equation because we have infrastructure awareness and visibility on Azure. There's granular storage at the blob level. Uh, there's warm immutability that was just uh, you know launched for both of the uh, solutions we offer. There's uh, Azure native data protection with role-based access control. There's self-service protection and, and recovery. Um, there's network isolated automated recovery. You go beyond data protection and recovery, you can actually fully automate movement of Azure-based workloads to different tiers of storage. And then even beyond data protection and storage, we're actually part of the MISA program with Microsoft that you know, to jointly partner on security and compliance vectors for customers. So, at the end of the day, I think it's a wonderful um, uh, symbiotic arrangement of you know, a value-added uh, role for customers, in, in, and especially in financial services. Yeah. I think one more thing, uh, you said it very well there, Jay. I think one more thing I would add, it's we are both also deeply invested in the industry, right? So Microsoft uh, over the last couple of years have pivoted 
more towards an industry specialty and focus. And so we have a whole organization just focused on financial services, our large capital markets and insurance and banking customers. And along with that comes awareness back to our engineering teams and our development teams as well, right? Because as Ajay mentioned before, this is a highly regulated space. And it's not the kind of environment where everyone is quick to move just because there's something new out there, right? It's it's usually based on necessity or it's based on on, on an absolute need. Uh, and I, th I think there's, there's a learning curve there and an understanding. So it's not always... Uh, the, the planning doesn't always happen cleanly as, as we would like. In a lot of these cases, systems have been patched or put together and, and data kind of exists in, in so many different places. Uh, and so we take this very seriously in, in the approach for financial services, also in working with regulators to, to understand and also uh, cover up any gaps or you know exposures that we see. Good. One last question for you both. What are the questions that organizations need to be answering today regarding their own ransomware defense capabilities? Joe, so you want to take that first and pass it off to Ajay for final thoughts? Yeah, I would say the first thing is, do you have a plan? There has to be a scenario where you, where you assume the worst case, it's going to happen. And what would you do, right? It's like a fire drill. How, how do you play that out? Uh, the second thing I would say is you have to do an assessment uh, on the compliance layers, to Ajay's point. Who has access to information? Is it the right level of access? Is it the right sensitivity of the data? And has that been you know, uh, class, uh, uh, clarified? Uh, the final thing I would say is readiness. I, I go back to this piece. Does everyone in the organization know what the potential cost of this is, right? And, and once you explain, hey, the trust quotient, once you explain the brand uh, challenges, People take it a lot more personally on, I need to, I need to be part of the solution. I need to be here, you know, in this journey and, and be well aware of, of what those gaps are and how I can help. I agree, Joe, because <clears throat> two of those sentiments that you mentioned, which is the plan and the readiness and the involvement of the people are absolutely key because you, you're, you're, <clears throat> I would say your plan is only as good as your last test, right? You test those policies, you conduct the recovery rehearsals. Um, and, and beyond that, I would say, it also starts in on the compliance and classification side of it, which is, do you know what data you have and where to store it? Because once you know that, then you say, can we protect what we need? And more importantly, delete what we don't. Because a lot of that stuff comes in and it reduces the attack surface available for all the criminals. It avoids the compliance issues. It, it, it helps a lot. And when you combine what you said, which is you know the people and the data, there are any companies two critical assets. So how do you ensure that breaches on one aren't coming from the other, right? So you're going beyond what we call zero trust. You're investing in the training, you're investing in the awareness. And, and at the end of the day, that will help companies ensure the integrity, uh, availability, and privacy of their data. Yeah. Very good. Terrific conversation. I appreciate your insights, both of you. Thank you so much. It was a joy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. on. appreciate being on with you both as well. Thank you. Again, you've just heard from Ajay Badia. He's with Veritas and Joe Thomas with Microsoft. Topic has been ransomware and compliance for Information Security Media Group. I'm Tom Field. Thank you for your time and attention today.